to the forest, to the forest health specialist and climate change coordinator. She works in the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. And the title of her talk is Defining Forest Health and Managed Forests. Good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. Uh, some of you who don't work in forest health uh, on a daily basis may wonder why this is an important topic to talk about. Um, why do we really need to define this? We're all good stewards and we're working towards uh, a common good of the forest. But um, I think we need to know where we're heading in order to develop strategies and actions that are going to get us there. Is that too much? Okay. okay. Um, it's sort of like the meaning of life, you know, every once in a while you need to reevaluate what your, your definition is uh, in order to see where, where you want to go into the future. So um, although uh, this is not really representing all of our departments thinking at this time, I, I think this is a good opportunity with scientists, researchers, natural resource professionals here. It's what VMC is about, to share ideas, to look for solutions, and I hope this will kind of stimulate uh, good dialogue here. Uh, within the department, uh, we ha we're operating under a mission statement that says we protect and manage for healthy forests. I love Vermont and I love forests and I think our forests are our awesome uh, best feature that we have. Um, so I'm here to really talk about um, how we can assess the status and trends of forest health and identify where the problems are so that this adaptive management solution can come into play. Quite often, I get asked, are our forests healthy? And at a stand level, I think many natural resource professionals uh, have ways that they can determine whether a stand is healthy. But on a bigger picture, can we answer this question? And if we do, what really is, um, what are the metrics? What, uh, how do we define this? Um, how do we know if a forest is unhealthy? Do we ever call a forest unhealthy? Uh, I think forests are probably in transitional stages. Um, so how do we define where they're at in that continuum from something that's less healthy to something that's more healthy? And most importantly, what are the benefits to society that uh, we hope to gain by having healthy forests? I thought it was very instructive when I came across a, a website, the National Institute of Health's website, where they're really talking about forest health. Um, and here's what they said. It's, crit it's particularly critical to identify thresholds for rapid forest decline because it can take many decades for forests to restore the services that they provide. Yeah. And they go on to say that although native forests are adapted to some level of disturbance, all forests now face novel stresses in the form of climate change, air pollution, and invasive pests. We just heard some great talks about all three of those. Detecting how intensification of these stresses will affect the trajectory of forests is a major concern. So I thought that was just a great uh, foundation for our discussion about what healthy forests are, how we measure them, um, and how we might uh, modify our definitions given the, the climate that we're in at this point in time. So at one point, I think forest abundance was the definition of forest health. As long as we have an abundant resource, then we're good to go. Um, right now, our forests in Vermont cover about 75% of the land area. And for the first time, we're starting to see that number start to decrease uh, with development, with fragmentation, with a number of land use changes. 
So I think forest health is a bit more than just having the land area forested. And our traditional definition of forest health is a condition where biotic and abiotic influences do not threaten management objectives now or in the future. Uh, given that this is a, a definition we, we commonly use, I thought I'd take a minute to march you through our monitoring for this year to give you a picture of, of what the biotic and abiotic influences are so that you can determine whether or not they threaten our management objectives. We do aerial surveys every year to detect forest damages. Uh, one of the significant factors this year was forest caterpillar defoliation, uh, which they, they munched their way through areas, especially in the northeastern part of the state. This map shows our results of the survey, which mapped basically about 25,000 acres of defoliated forests. So uh, by the middle or late June of each year, forest tent caterpillar is done feeding, uh, and forests look like this when defoliation is significant. This last year, we normally rely on refoliation for trees to restore starch levels um, after a defoliation, and in the past, um, that has been the case. Uh, for this year, we found refoliation really slow and in some areas uh, really non-existent. So we're concerned about long-term effects of that. And coupled with that, or possibly because of that, um, the drought really had an effect on, uh, on tree health, uh, on forest health, and we saw symptoms of that in, in the form of uh, dieback and uh, flagging of, of trees. Um, and uh, in addition, there were maple webworm and maple trumpet skeletonizers, also native insects, and they take advantage of things like forest tent caterpillar that, that uh, damage leaves, and then they, they come in and, and form their uh, webs around leaves. Uh, and the reason that we look at these, although normally not thought of as uh, major forest pests, is because um, history tells us that in 1950, Wisconsin experienced a very similar uh, threesome of, of pests that ended in uh, thousands of acres of mortality of sugar maple. So we're keeping our eye on this, and this is part of our, our monitoring. Uh, in addition, we have uh, plots around the state where we look at the impacts of something like uh, forest tent caterpillar. We have sugar maple plots, and we have plots that the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative does jointly between the state and the university. Um, and uh, one of the, the types of measurements taken are um, the transparency, how dense the foliage is, and the dieback. Uh, uh, and impact from more recent stresses. In our sugar maple plots, uh, this is showing um, just those trees that had very thin foliage over time since 1988 when we started, and it shows what pests were responsible for uh, upticks in thin foliage. Uh, this last year, we had forest tent caterpillar. The year before that, it was frost injury. And at this point, it doesn't look like a significant long-term health problem, but we know it's just affecting a small portion of our sugar maple resource. Uh, the other uh, long-term monitoring plots did show um, kind of steady transparency, but uh, an uptick in the amount of dieback. Uh, so these are, you know, species at large. So we're seeing some shifting, some stands maybe uh, less vigorous than, than others. We also uh, are aware of ash declines around the state. 
and have monitoring um, systems in particular to eliminate the possibility that it's caused by emerald ash borer. Last year we had some intensive studies in Bennington County. This year the focus is in the northwestern part of the state, uh, as well as statewide uh, surveys to look for uh, emerald ash borer. And I'm pleased to announce that so far we have not found it in Vermont, nor have we found uh, the Asian longhorn beetle. So as far as the um, big invasive insects, we're uh, at a fairly low level compared to neighbor states. We do see white pine needle damage, and this has been persisting now for over 10 years. Um, and we're looking into what are the long-term impacts of something like that on the, on the white pine um, uh, tree uh, resource. For uh, hemlock woolly adelgid, which has been in southern Vermont, mostly in this southeastern corner, we are picking up mortality of trees. The graph shows you uh, our winter survey of survival. Last year was a particularly bad year for hemlock woolly adelgid, and 97% of the insects that we surveyed uh, were, were dead, so the populations knocked back. It's still existing out there, uh, but uh, for a moment the trees are winning. Uh, and another invasive pest, the balsam woolly adelgid, we're finding uh, more mortality up in the northeastern part of the state where we hadn't really uh, had much in the past. Uh, this insect, it's the white on the bark that you see, uh, can cause pretty rapid mortality, and that's what we're seeing up there, possibly exacerbated by the dry conditions. So that was a whiz-bang of what we're seeing as far as biotic and abiotic uh, problems in the state. So I repeat my question, you know, are our forests healthy? Well, I've been working on climate change quite a bit, as well as some other sort of statewide um, projects to, to assess forest health with management um, and without management of forests. And I, I must say, basically all forests in, in the state are managed one way or another. They're, they have landowners who have objectives and they're managing those forests in, in a certain way to meet those objectives. So um, even if, if you have forests that are just managed for recreation or, or other purposes, they, they are managed in one way or another. So um, when you go in to do an assessment of whether a, a stand is healthy or not, uh, you you may not know what the objective is that the, the manager or landowner has. So how do you assess whether that, that is healthy uh, given the, the variety of ecosystem services that, um, that can be provided? And here are two examples of, of what I'm talking about. In the top corner um, is an example of tree of a stand where you have a lot of dead snags. The landowner may well have been trying to increase wildlife potential in that stand. So if I go in and, and see 10% mortality, uh, I might say the stand is not healthy, but healthy for what? Um, and on the other hand, where we have patch cuts or other types of harvesting to inspire new regeneration, if I go in there to assess the health of that and see very little regeneration, my conclusion is going to be quite different than what the landowner might be envisioning down the line. So I think that um, our definition of forest health really has to incorporate how we're using forests, and it might be different depending on, on the uses. Um, but it has to measure both condition and function. So in different forests, our expectations are going to be different. Uh, 
our expectations in parks and urban areas are different than in rural forests. Our expectations for healthy forests in, in uh, the top of mountains is different. At roadsides or along power lines, all of these areas um, really have different management objectives and therefore our expectations are different. Uh, for example, in urban areas, we have metrics that will help us kind of assess whether or not uh, those forests are healthy, but it depends on what our goals are. Um, what are the thresholds that we're going to use for, uh, for healthy forests? And um, we often have tipping points that uh, for some sort of action, and um, they may be influenced by our management objective, natural variability, uh, or other things. And recently, climate change factors have to be considered in those definitions and thresholds, or we aren't really going to, to meet our, um, our objectives. So here are my, my final take homes. Um, resilient for, forests, health, uh, healthy forests are resilient and they're capable of, of restoring ecological productivity, complexity, and diversity. And if we go one step further and say that resilient forests um, are forests that when impacted by low intensity disturbance have the ability to quickly recover, uh, then I think we can apply this to all the different forest types that I mentioned. So I'll end there, and um, I hope to have some good conversations with you on this topic. Thank you very much.